Hello, I'm Nigel Leesk, and this is my lecture, Old Ways and New Roads, Travels in Scotland, 1720-1832. For much of the 20th century, Scottish Romanticism has tended to be regarded in relation to an organic English Wordsworthian Romanticism as an intermittent, shadowy anachronism, a temporal as well as a spatial border of Romanticism. Or so um, uh, I argued the editors of an important 2000 and four volume entitled Scotland and the Borders of Romanticism, which said how to challenge that perspective. They continued, Scotland, neither English nor foreign, stands for an inauthentic romanticism, defined by a mystified, purely ideological commitment to history and folklore. Rather than being a site of romantic production, Scotland's fate was to have become a romantic object or commodity. Glamorous scenery visited by the Wordsworths, Turner, Queen Victoria, steam train parties of tourists, a series of kitsch, fake, more or less reactionary inventions of tradition from Ossian and Scott to Fiona MacLeod and Brigadoon. Moreover, as Murray Pittock argues in Scottish and Irish Romanticism, the inward and aestheticized Romanticism of the post-World War II era excluded Scottish Romanticism particular, in particular, partly because of its strong social dimension, and partly because of its language, rather unaccountably considered uh, too difficult for students nonetheless expected to grapple with Chaucer and the Gawain poet. Partly due to the endeavors of these and other critics, such a negative view of Scottish Romanticism has changed post-1997. Influenced by archipelagic or four nations literary history, which situates British and Irish Romanticism in the context of global empire, as well as devolutionary and post-colonial resistances to metropolitan London-based models of literary formation. Moreover, Pittock also proposes that Scottish Romanticism may benefit from a different periodicity, period, periodicity than English, especially the suggestion that Scottish Enlightenment and Romanticism are dovetailed together in a manner quite distinct from the model of Romantic rupture that holds more true south of the border. James Chandler has emphasized the importance of Scottish Enlightenment stadial theory, a body of thought formulated by Adam Ferguson, Adam Smith and others who conceptualized societal development as a movement from a primitive hunter-gatherer stage to modern commercial society, in determining the chronotope of romantic historicism, a new pre preoccupation with the dating of the cultural place, the location of the cultural moment. At the heart of Scottish Romanticism lies just such a dialectical relationship between history and geography. That's to say, between contrasting historical stages, the primitive world of the oceanic warrior juxtaposed with economic modernity as theorized by David Hume or Adam Smith, and between local places and global spaces, the localism of Burns's poetry or Scott's novels, juxtaposed with the global reach of a Scotland recently integrated into the British Empire. This dynamic model suggests that far from being merely a passive object or commodity, Scottish Romanticism was characterized by an inquisitive spirit of historical and national self-reflection. This model informs the title and theme of the new Hunterian exhibition and accompanying publication, Old Ways and New Roads, Travels in Scotland, 1720 to 1832, uh, represented on my first slide. This project focuses on the nation's dynamic 18th century tra transition into modernity, known in the 18th century as improvement, and the opening up of its towns, landscapes and people to travel and tourism. Of course, it's true that romantic tourists often sought out the archaic and picturesque, in preference to sites of social or economic modernity. But herein lies a tourist paradox, whereby the fascination with the old ways of Scotland, especially in the Gaelic speaking highlands and islands, was only made possible by the modern infrastructure of new roads and other improvements, many of them initiated by the British state from the 1720s onwards to exert political control over Scotland. And here you can see a portrait of General Wade. Um, and in the background, you can see here the road builders working. Uh, in this case, on the um, military road over to Fort Augustus at Corriarric. Especially in the Highlands, tourists followed hot on the heels of the military and the forces of improvement. Yet this didn't mean that Scotland was simply formulated and reformulated in response to English needs as an exotic object to be consumed during a period of consolidating Britishness. This is evident from the three renowned Scottish writers who are the focus of my lecture today underlining Scotland's role as a site of romantic production, as well as consumption 
All three explored the old ways from a modernizing perspective, affording new imaginative resonance to Scotland's culture and often barren though spectacular landscapes. Um, first on the left here, we have James McPherson, the translator of the poems of Ossian in the middle, Robert Burns, Ayrshire's plowman poet, and on the right, Sir Walter Scott, best-selling poet and novelist of the 19th century. All three writers travel extensively in Scotland, McPherson through the West Highlands and Hebrides in 1760 to 61, collecting Ossianic verse. Burns through the Central Highlands in 1787, gathering songs and music. And Scott sailed around the entire coast of Scotland on board the Faros lighthouse, uh, lighthouse ship in 1814, researching settings for his poems and novels. The real tra trailblazers of the Scottish tour um, in the 18th century were the Welsh naturalist Thomas Pennant and the Englishman Dr Johnson, who had followed hot on his heels. The closure of the war years of 1793 and, uh, to 1815, and the rise of a newly prosperous British middle class, did much to stimulate home or domestic tourism, which replaced the aristocratic grand tour to France and Italy. Trepid women now joined men in exploring even remoter parts of the country, many leaving, many leaving journals or sketchbooks of their tours. To a greater extent, though, than the new domestic tourism in the English lakes, in, the, in Wales or in Ireland, the Scottish Romantic Tour is a profoundly literary phenomenon, largely due to the popularity of Macpherson, Burns and Scott, as well as other writers. If more time was available, I would discuss the work of the great Gaelic poet Alastair MacBeister Alastair, James Hogg, the Ettrick Shepherd, or Scottish women poets, playwrights and novelists like Anne Grant of Lagan, Joanna Bailey and Susan Ferrier. In the first part, I'm going to, um, in the rest of the first part of this lecture, I'm going to focus on Macpherson and the Ossianic Sublime. Macpherson was, um, uh, his dates were 1736 to 96, was a Gaelic speaking native of Badenoch on Speyside, who after studying at Aberdeen University began collecting heroic ballads of ancient provenance from Highland popular culture, recited or written down in his native Gaelic. Describing the feats of Fingal, that was the Scottish name for the legendary Celtic hero Finn McCool and his heroic band of Fenian warriors. Scholarly interest in folklore or the discovery of the people in Peter Burke's terms was one important aspect of European Romanticism and Scotland was one of the earliest uh, European countries to witness the phenomenon. So all three dis writers I'm, dis I'm discussing in this lecture, McPherson, Burns and Scott, were important collectors of folklore and music as well as best-selling authors. Although Macpherson was only one of a number of 18th century collectors scouring Cayley houses and old libraries in the Highlands for surviving fragments of, of Gallic heroic verse, he was the first to attempt English translation and publication for a wider audience. In doing so, he took a number of liberties with his oral or manuscript sources in enhancing their appeal to a polite 18th century readership, leading to charges, uh, many of which still um, stick to him, that he um, uh, enhanced um, that he faked or concocted the stories. And the most damaging accusation came from the pen of Dr. Samuel Johnson. Um, and Johnson famously uh, toured the Highlands um, and Islands um, in 1773 uh, to try to check the authenticity of Ossian's sources. Here's Dr. Johnson in his traveling costume. Johnson wrote, um, I look upon Macpherson's Fingal to be as gross an imposition as ever the world was troubled with. Had it really been an ancient work, a true specimen of how men thought at the time, it would have been a curiosity of the first rate. As a modern production, it is nothing. Although no admirer of Dr. Johnson, William Wordsworth would agree a few years later, provocatively describe, describing the person's poem as the smug embrace of a phantom begotten, sorry, <laughs> the snug, uh, or seen as the phantom begotten by the sm smug embrace of an impudent Highlander upon a cloud of tradition. Ossian may have been a phantom, but it was to have a remarkable, powerful influence in haunting British and European Romanticism. Macpherson attributed his poems to the third century Celtic bard Ossian Ossian, the last of his race, who in his youth had fought with a Fianna and had survived as a blind old man to lament the death of his father uh, Fingal and, and his son Oscar, as well as the passing of the heroic era immediately preceding the introduction of Christianity. Now, in the inter aftermath of the military defeat of the Jacobite armies at Culloden in 1746, 
This also, of course, reflected on the contemporary collapse of Gallic clan society. McPherson's main publications were Fragments of Ancient Poetry, 1760, followed by two epic poems, Fingal, 1761 to two, and Temora, 1763, which achieved massive success, being rapidly translated into Italian, French, and German in that order, reaching an international audience, including Goethe, Thomas Jefferson, and Napoleon. McPherson's introduction and, and notes, uh, published with an important dissertation on Ossian by Edinburgh's leading critic, Dr. Hugh Blair, explained how he had translated the original Gallic verse into cadenced English prose, drawing both on the primitive style of biblical texts like the Song of Solomon and the epic similes of Homer and Virgil. As a major harbinger of romantic taste, the narratives were imbued with sentimental pathos and their ancient Highland and Irish settings resonated with the sublime, made newly fashionable by Edmund Burke in his 1759 essay on the sublime and the beautiful which he described it as a sort of delightful horror, a sort of tranquility tinged with terror. Hugh Blair um, uh, evoked the primitive vigor of the sublime style when he wrote, among poets of more polished times, we are to look um, for the grace, graces of correct writing, for just proportions of parts and skillfully conducted narration. But amidst the rude scenes of nature and society, such as Ossian describes, amidst rocks and torrents, and whirlwinds and battles dwells the sublime, and naturally associates itself with that grave and solemn spirit which distinguished the author of Fingal. Let's look briefly at fragment eight uh, from Macpherson's uh, Fragments of Ancient Poetry collected in the Highlands of Scotland. You can see the, the cover, the, cover of the front page here, title page, um, which uh, a collection which more accurately than Fingal and Tamora represents the broken re remains of the authentic Gallic heroic tradition. By the side of a rock on the hill, beneath the aged trees, old Ossian sat on the moss, the last of the race of Fingal. Sightless are his aged eyes, his beard is waving in the wind. Dull through the leafless trees, he heard the voice of the north. Sorry, sorrow revived in his soul. He began and lamented the dead. Where is Fingal the king? Where is Oscar my son? Where are all my race? Alas, in the earth they lie. I feel their tombs with my hands. This framework of elegy by a poet who had, has outlived both his father and his son is a frequent device in Macpherson's poems, drawing the emphasis away from the epic actions of the past to a more romantic mood like the shift from what uh, the German um, critic Schiller called naive to sentimental poetry. Casting his mind back to the heroic past, Ossian recalls how Fingal had been challenged by an upstart called Gaul, son of Morny, who boasted, I'm strong as a storm in the ocean, as a whirlwind on the hill. Urging the warriors to depose Fingal and welcome him as their leader instead. A fight scene inevitably follows and it's the first of an interminable uh, sequence uh, of fights threading through the whole Oceanic corpus um, it follows this impudent challenge to Fingal's authority and the two mighty warriors battle it out. The earth is ploughed with their heels, long did they toil, with night they fell on the sounding plain, as two oaks with their branches mingled fall crashing from the hill. And here you can see Runciman's painting of, um, a drawing rather, of uh, Fingal uh, in armour uh, and one of the stout oaks uh, which is so frequently uh, um, evoked in, in the metaphors of uh, Macpherson's translations of Ossian. In fragment eight, a victorious Fingal binds the defeated Gaul, but then chivalrously releases his captive in response to the prayers of Gaul's sister, Minvan the Maid, declaring magnanimously, take thy brother, O Minvan, thou fairer than the snow of the north. Macpherson is here endowing Iron Age Caledonian hunter warriors with all the virtues of medieval Christian chivalry, an example, perhaps, of Ossian's retro modernity. In Daffod Moore's concise formulation, Macpherson has created a sentimental savage for the 18th century, a man, quote, stained in equal measure with tears and gore. Fingal's um, heroism is again eclipsed by the melancholy narrative framework in which the poem returns in the final paragraph, the voice of the bard Ossian, as you see here at the bottom passage on the on the slide. Such Fingal were thy words, but thy words I hear no more. 
Sightless, I sit by the tomb. I hear the voice in the wood, but no more I hear my friends. The cry of the hunter is over. The voice of war is ceased. The popularity of uh, Ossian inspired a whole new generation of tourists to visit the highlands and even transformed the rain and mist of Scottish summer into an opportunity to experience the ghostly sublime, as well as the equally fashionable picturesque. In 1766, the English blue-stocking writer Elizabeth Montague, who you can see here, wrote to her husband, We carry Ossian's poems with us, as we shall see some of you classic ground. Uh, it's on her tour of Scotland. Passing through Glen Crow on the military road, she described Highland landscape and the cadence prose made popular um, by um, Ossian's, uh, by Macpherson. Uh, the cheeks of the mountains were furrowed by the falling streams and the grey moss of age grew upon them. Here and there a fir tree shattered by a thousand storms and huge rocks that had rolled halfway down formed the terrible, uh, the terrible sublime. Further Oceanic, um, sorry, um, in 1772, uh, another um, a tourist, this time a more scientific uh, explorer type tourist, uh, the English naturalist Joseph Banks, sailed down the Sound of Mull on his route, on, on route to Iceland. Um, and he was a great fan of um, Macpherson's Ossian. And looking to starboard, he admired the Morven Peninsula. Morven, the land of heroes, once the seat of, uh, the, of the exploits of Fingal, the mother of the romantic scenery of Ossian. I lamented the busy bustle of the ship, and had I dared to venture, the censure of my companions would certainly have brought her to an anchor. To have read 10 pages of Ossian under the shades of these woods would have been a luxury above the reach of kings. Further Ossianic transports awaited Joseph Banks, when just a few days later, he claimed to have discovered the uh, volcanic Hebridean island of Staffa, with its spectacular basaltic sea cave, which you can see uh, in a drawing by one of his artists, uh, made actually on this on the visit with Banks. You can see Banks and his party exploring the cave in this image, this wonderful image. We asked the name of it. Said our guide, the cave of Heen. What is Heen, said we. Heen Makul, whom the translators of Ossian's works have called Fingal. How fortunate that in this cave we should meet with the remembrance of that chief whose existence, as well as that of the whole epic poem, is almost doubted in England. Hebridean landscapes seemed ample proof to Banks of the authenticity of the poems of Ossian, whatever the opinions of Dr. Johnson. And even today, Fingal's Cave, immortalized by the romantic music of Felix Mendelssohn, remains the most famous site of Fingalian topography in the world. Perhaps the most sensational Fingalian site, though, on the 18th century Petit Tour, um, was <coughs> the Duke of Athol's Ossian Hall at Dunkeld in Perthshire, a pavilion for viewing the falls of the River Bran, described by Malcolm Andrews as one of the picturesque sites, one of the finest picturesque sites in Britain. Here's a, a, a plan made by a visitor in 1806, the Reverend Symes. Um, the, the, this building has been demolished. There's a new uh, modern reconstruction which hardly captures the feeling of the original building. Constructed by uh, Lord John Murray in 1757 as a surprise for his uncle, the original hermitage was rebranded as Ossian's Hall in 1783 by the fourth Duke of Athol, after the installation of a painting of the blind bard, which slid open to reveal the viewing chamber. And this just shows the, the popularity of, of Ossian in these decades, um, the, the, the rebranding of the tourist landscape in Scotland to accommodate the popularity of Macpherson's uh, Ossian poems. In the work of words of a visitor, a tourist called a uh, Londoner called Elizabeth Diggle, who visited in 1788, it is called a hermitage, but has more resemblance to a fairy palace called up in a moment by the stroke of her wand and suspended among rocks and close to a noble cascade. The entrance is by a rude Gothic porch, a painting of the blind bard Ossian being the only figure that strikes the eye. He disappears at the touch of an invisible spring, and you're introduced to a most elegant room adorned in the most improved style of modern art. I conceive both these apartments are meant as emblematic of the ancient and modern times. So this was a carefully contrived tourist experience um, uh, devised by the, um, by the Duke. The, um, here, is, um, here is Elizabeth Diggle's manuscript of that, of that very passage, 
which is, um, is in the collection of Glasgow University Special Collections. But, but the Wordsworths were not impressed when they visited in 1803, and Dorothy describes how she and her brother both erupted in laughter at the elaborate, sc elaborate scenic illusions which seemed to spoil the simple beauty of the brown waterfall. Wordsworth later composed a poetic effusion to set free the bard from such indignity. The sublime here easily collapsed into the, ridic collapsed into the ridiculous, and to, the romantic, to romantic naturalists like the Wordsworths, Ossian was beginning to feel artificial, stagey, insufficiently naturalistic. But thousands of enthusiastic visitors disagreed, and Ossian's Hall at Dunkeld reminds us of the extent to which Scottish landowners like the Duke of Athol were capitalising on literary fashions to establish a tourist infrastructure through su the southern and central highlands. This was especially so on the popular petty tour, which uh, a term coined by the traveller Thomas Pennant, which could be travelled by chase in a fortnight from Glasgow up through the, the highlands. You can see the line there on the map um, and round um, to, um, down to Argyle, through Perthshire to um, along Loch Tay, to uh, eventually to Inverary, and then back to, um, back to Glasgow and then, and then to Edinburgh. Um, and re really showcasing the improved landscapes of um, the Dukes of Bredal the Earl of Bredalbin, the Duke of Athol and the Duke of Argyll. In the next uh, um, part of the lecture, in the second part of the lecture, I'll uh, be following um, a famous, a celebrity tourist on that petty tour. Um, and we'll look um, how uh, Robert Burns reacted and represented that, the petty tour in his, um, in, his, in, his, in his poetry and verse and song. Um, and the third section, we'll move on to look at the tours and the uh, romancing of Walter Scott. So I'm going to end the first section of the uh, of the lecture now. Morning. This is the second of my um, uh, three-part lecture on Old Ways, New Roads, uh, Scottish Romanticism and the Highland Tour. Part two, My Hearts in the Highland, uh, Robert Burns's Highland Tour of August, September 1787. Although Robert Burns's name has been yoked to the Highlands largely on account of his brief love affair with Mary Campbell, Heel and Mary, the fame of his song, My Hearts in the Highlands, and the subsequent tartanization of the global Burns cult. In fact, he was a lowland farmer burnt, born and bred. After the publication of his Kilmarnock and Edinburgh poems in 1786 and 1787, financial success made a tour of his native country possible for the cash-strapped Ayrshire poet. Although other motives, uh, another motive was a desire to collect Highland songs and melodies for James Johnson's song collection, the Scottish Musical Museum. In a letter of um, uh, October 1787, Burns described the 22-day, 600-mile tour of the Highlands he made with his friend Willie Nicholl in a horse-drawn chase in August and September, largely travelling along um, General Wade's military roads. I have done nothing but visited cascades, prospects, ruins and druidical temples, learned Highland tunes and picked up Scotch songs, Jacobite anecdotes, etc. these two months. He left <clears throat> only a sparse account of his tour in a diary, which I've edited for the new Oxford Burns uh, edition. However, as the work of a celebrity tourist, the poems and songs that Burns wrote on his Highland tour attracted a great deal of attention from contemporaries. And visit many visitors, including William and Dorothy Wordsworth in 1803, flocked to visit the sites where Burns had composed famous songs like The Banks of the Devon, Alan Water, The Berks of Aberfeldy, and Castle Gordon as well as tour poems like Written with a Pencil Over the Chimney Piece in the Parlour of the Inn at Kenmore, or The Humble Petition of um, uh, Brewer Water to the Noble Duke of Athol. And we'll look at those poems later. Places associated with Burns soon became, uh, began to compete with sites of oceanic interest, although perhaps not on the same scale as those associated with Walter Scott's romances, as we'll see in the final section of this lecture. Burns was himself an Ossian tourist who had found his return journey uh, to Edinburgh down Scotland's flat east coast rather dull compared to the allure of the glens. The rest of my stages are not worth rehearsing. Warm as I was from Ossian's country, where I'd seen his very grave, what cared I for fisher towns and fertile castles? But the fact that so much of his tour went was through the more improved, planted and picturesque portions of the central highlands rather than the barrenness mountainous west, sorry, the barren mountainous west, 
perhaps explains why the oceanic sublime tends to be eclipsed by conventional descriptions of picturesque and beautiful scenery. Although as a working farmer, Burns was also interested in noting the condition of agriculture in every place he visited. Like Scott, Burns' interest in the Highlands was infused with a sentimental Jacobitism that led him to idolize the Jacobite leader, Prince Charles Edward Stuart. This impelled him to scratch the following lines, attacking the Hanoverian monarchy on a window in an inn during his stay at Stirling. The injured Stuart line are gone, a race outlandish fill their throne, an idiot race to honor lost, who knows them best, despise them most. However, Burns's Jacobite sympathies didn't do him any harm a few days later, when he was a guest in the noble houses of the Dukes of Athol and Gordon, both Dukes linked by close family ties to leading Jacobite exiles, despite their own proclaimed loyalty to the Hanoverians. With the imminent death of uh, the exiled Bonnie Prince Charlie, Jacobitism no longer represented a political threat to the British establishment, and its adherents and culture became objects of romantic celebration, representing dynastic loyalties and courage under duress. By the time of uh, Burns's 1787 Highland holiday, the so-called Petit Tour had itself become something of a beaten track. The tourists, many of them from south of the border, could avail themselves of decent roads, bridges, inns, and other tourist facilities. Yet the progress of improvement was uneven and was already causing indebted landlords to raise rents, forcing many Highlanders to emigrate to America. Burns's contradictory poetic response to uh, John Campbell, 4th Earl of Bredalbin, whose beautiful Tamouth estate he visited on 29th August, illustrates the stark contrast between the poet's powerful expression of radical anger in support of the victims of improvement and his pragmatic ability to offer the Scottish landed classes exactly what they wanted to hear. Well, this was really, although this was really the beginning of um, uh, the notorious Highland clearances, at this stage, uh, Highland uh, Scottish landlords were opposed to emigration because they needed military recruits at home, as well as a large labour force to support various economic projects. Here is a portrait of the fourth Earl of Bredalbin as a young man by Angelica Kaufman. In June 1786, Burns had penned a radical poem in Scots entitled The Address of Beelzebub, it was never published in his lifetime, denouncing Bredalbin who was president of the London Highland Society for conniving with Macdonald of Glengarry to prevent the immigration of 500 Glengarry clansmen to Canada, where poor dunghill sons of dirt and mire, they may to patrician rights aspire. Here Beelzebub, aka the devil, recommends that Bredalbon and Glengarry exploit their clansmen at home instead, forcing them into virtual slave labor, even selling the women into prostitution in London. Yet, while they're only poined and herit, they'll keep their stubborn heel and spirit, but smash them, crush them out of spales, and rot the divers of the jails. The young dogs swinge them to the labour, let work and hunger make them sober. The hisses, if their ortlins fosn't, let them in Drury Lane be lessened. Drury Lane being a notorious red light district in London. In the poem's conclusion, Burns imagined Bredalman sitting in hell next to King Herod, Pizarro, conqueror of Peru, and other historical villains as guests of Beelzebub. But in contrast, visiting um, the Earl of Bredalbin's seat at Tamworth Castle just a year later, he now inscribed a weak effusion entitled, written with a pencil over the chimney piece in the parlor of the inn at Kenmore Tamworth, um, an inn that had been constructed by the Earl 20 years earlier for the accommodation of tourists. Um, this is one of Scotland's oldest inns, and actually you can still see Burns's poem uh, in pencil written above the chimney piece there, lovingly protected by a sheet of perspex. Here, um, Burns's radical anger of the preceding year against the Earl of Bredalbin seems to have evaporated as he describes his savage journey through the abodes of covered grouse and timid sheep. He's referring there to the small glen um, with the Ossian's grave. Uh, and Glenquake in, in Perthshire, till famed Bredalbin opens to my view. And he sees, he praises the palace rising on the verdant side, the lawns wood fringed in nature's native taste. Tamworth Castle and its policies had been extensively modelled by William Adam and Jan Griffier for the third Earl. It was consequently one of the most elaborate designed landscapes in Scotland and an essential stop on the tourist 
circuit. Although unmentioned in his journal, uh, Burns and Nicol um, also visited the nearby Hermitage, a Gothic pavilion for viewing the Achan waterfall constructed by Bredalban in the 1760s above the southeastern shores of Loch Tay. Such viewing pavilions were important for framing the romantic vision of waterfall and other landscape features, as we've seen in relation to the Dunkeld, the Ossian Hall at Dunkeld. An English tourist called Stebbing Shaw, visiting Achan just two days after Burns, wrote, uh, he describing the, the, the experience of, of visiting, of seeing, of viewing the waterfall uh, through the hermitage. We passed through an artificial cave to the supposed hermit's room, well feigned and hung naturally with moss, roots, etc. From the window of the curious cell, another sweet fall of water is seen to dash over the opposite rock, near 60 feet into a basin below, which adds greatly to the enchantment of this sequestered scene. Shaw proceeded to quote Burns's poem in its entirety, which he claimed to have discovered written on the wall in the inn at Kenmore on the 2nd of September. And this shows just how much Burns was himself being uh, currently converted into a, into a tourist attraction. He was a tourist who was also a tourist attraction, an attraction for other tourists. Lines 17 to 20 of Burns's poem describe the Achan Hermitage, inviting comparison with Burns's other descriptions of the falls of Moness and the Berks of Aberfeldy, and perhaps more ambitiously, um, the falls of Foyers on the south side of Loch Ness. Poetic ardours in my bosom swell, lone wandering by the hermit's mossy cell, the sweeping theatre of hanging woods, the incessant roar of headlong tumbling floods. Burns imagines himself occupying the role of an oceanic hermit in Bredalban's mossy cell. Here poesy might wake her heaven-taught lyre and look through nature with creative fire. Political critique of the dire social consequences of Highland improvement is replaced here by picturesque platitude, dedicated to the search for aristocratic patronage. This would be more successfully solicited, given that, um, the, that the Earl of Bredalban was absent when Burns visited, in the poet's subsequent visits to Blair Castle and Castle Gordon. Visiting Blair Castle on 31st August, the 1st of September, Burns was invited to dine with the Duke of Athol and his family, and they are introduced to his future patron, Robert Graham of Fintry. The poet noted in his journal, visited the scenes round Blair, fine but spoilt with bad taste, tilt and Gary rivers, falls on the tilt, heather seat, riding company with Sir William Murray and Mr Walker to Loch Tummel. Burns's criticism of the bad taste of Blair was probably aimed at the neoclassical formalism of the Hercules Garden in Diana's Grove, which you can still see in the grounds of Blair Castle, raising the interesting spectacle of a plowman poet um, uh, lecturing a duke on how to design his policies. His criticism was more tactfully expressed in his poem, entitled The Humble Petition of Brewer Water to the Noble Duke of Athol, perhaps his best poem inspired by the Highland Tour, which he sent to the duke by way of thanking him for his hospitality. Burns and Willie Nicholl visited the Falls of Brewer, only recently discovered as a beauty spot, as they left Blair on the road to Inverness. Visitors uh, to the Falls now park in the high-end shopping centre, the House of Brewer, in order to climb up to see the Falls. Burns's note to the poem's title states that Brewer Falls are the finest in the country, but not a bush about them, which spoils much of their beauty. Quite possibly, he'd seen Charles Stewart's painted wall panels of the Falls of Brewer in the richly stuccoed green dining room at Blair Castle, uh, shown here in this photograph today, where he had dined with the Athols on the preceding night. Stewart's view of the Upper Falls shows a rocky, bare landscape with only the occasional tree leaning precariously over the spectacular waterfall. That's the one I think on the on the left. The one ahead of you is um, is the uh, Dunkeld Fall, uh, the Bran Fall, the, the Falls of the Black Lynn. In this uh, romantic eco-poem, Burns ventriloquizes the voice of the River Brewer in addressing the Duke, facetiously describing himself in line four as your humble slave, a term that as a Democrat, Burns would never of course have applied to himself. The Brewer, although confident that he is worth going a mile to see, is mortified to have disappointed poet Burns because half my channel was dry. He accordingly petitions the Duke to plant trees on his banks. <laughs> 
Would then my noble master please to grant my highest wishes. He'll shade my banks with towering trees and bonnies spreading bushes. Delighted doubly then, my lord, you'll wander on my banks and listen, Monny, a grateful bird, return your thankful, your tuneful thanks. The poem praises woodland where songbirds might sing, shepherds weave their crown of flowers and lovers meet, their embraces screened by fragrant birks. Woodland here symbolizes shade, shelter, a thriving landscape, and above all, noble patronage. In one sense, Burns is picking up a constant concern of 18th century tour narrative, the treelessness of 18th century Scottish landscape, about which travellers like Dr Johnson had had much to say. The humble petition also seeks figuratively to shore up the Duke's uh, status uh, and future lineage through tree planting, enhancing both the aesthetic and commercial value of the Athol estates. In the poem's penultimate stanza, Burns even represents the River Brewer, giving the Duke a lecture on some of the technicalities of tree planting. It's a very clever, artful device, this poem. Let lofty firs and ashes cool my lowly banks or spread, or view deep bending in the pool their shadows watery bed. Let fragrant birks and woodbines dressed my craggy cliffs adorn, and for the little songster's nest a close embowering thorn. Burns's poem was well received by the Duke and the success of Burns's petition entered tourist lore. For example, in 1840, Black's picturesque tourist guide to Scotland described the Falls of Brewer as covered with fir plantations formed by the late Duke of Athol in compliance with the request of Burns in the well-known petition. And that's a, a picture of the falls today. You can see how um, heavily wooded the banks, its banks are. Visiting the Falls of Brewer in 1803 for the sake of Burns, Dorothy Wordsworth noted that both sides of the stream to a considerable height were planted with firs and larches intermingled, children of poor Burns's song. For his sake, we wished they'd been the natural trees of Scotland, birches, ashes, mountain ashes, etc. However, 60 or 70 years hence, there will be no unworthy monument to his memory. It seems that the Duke waited until um, Burns's death in 1796 before planting the trees as an act of commemoration. Although, ironically, he'd followed the spirit but not the letter of Burns's poem, planting what Dorothy Wordsworth regarded as undesirable exotic larches rather than native Scottish trees around the falls. But nonetheless, Burns's humble address of Brewer reveals how even a celebrity romantic poet could exercise some agency in shaping the Scottish landscape. That's the end of the second section of my lecture. Uh, in the final, third and final section, I'll move to Walter Scott. Thank you. Hello, this is the third um, and final section of my lecture, Old Ways, New Roads, Scottish Romanticism and the Highland Tour. Part three, the fairy ground of romance and poetry, Sir Walter Scott and the Highland Tour. Painted sometime around 1820, John Knox's view of Loch Katrin is unusual in placing modern tourists admiring a sublime Highland landscape so explicitly centre stage. You can see um, the uh, Loch Katrin uh, from the Trossachs. You can see uh, Ben Benu above, uh, towering above in this very spectacular painting. It features two fashionable young gentlemen and their elegant female companion, looking rather smarty, smarter than uh, William and Dorothy Wordsworth um, and the poet Coleridge would have done when they visited in 1803. Pausing to take the view up the loch from the popular beauty spot known as the Trossachs. Judging by their parasols and picnic basket, they're about to take a boat to the wooded islet towards which one of the men gestures, his words drowned out by the kilted bagpiper beside him. His theatrical flourish enforces the message that this is a landscape of epic scale and spectacle. Its drama, drama lies not only in the shaggy woodland at the water's edge or the twin summits of Benvenu soaring above the rocky backdrop, but in its rich, albeit recent, literary associations. Like hundreds of other tourists, the party have been drawn to the spot by Walter Scott's best-selling poem of 1810, The Lady of the Lake which gave new resonance to the scenic attractions of this relatively accessible, but until then not regularly visited 
area of the highlands. It's pretty easy to get to from both Glasgow and Stirling. At least 50,000 copies of Scott's poem had been sold by 1836, and it's anticipated Scott's later poems and novels by being adapted for the popular theatre, opera, panoramic displays, and even a wallpaper design. The tourist Isabella Spence estimated that 500 tourist carriages visited the Trossachs in the first year of its publication alone. So in our painting, Knox's tourists are bound for Ellen's Isle, the setting of the poem's opening cantos. It's the island you can see on the other side of the loch from the, um, the boat stage. The female um, uh, protagonist of Scott's poem, uh, uh, Ellen Douglas, uh, the eponymous Lady of the Lake, has caught, been courted by both um, James Fitzjames, who is the, this, uh, um, the disguised King of Scotland, who's been diverted from his stag hunt by her charms, and her own betrothed, Malcolm Graham. Quite possibly, Knox is alluding to Scott's literary um, love triangle in his painting. Is the young lady in the Jane Austen dress and parasol being courted by both the young men in top hats as the trio indulge in their own form of holiday romance? We might imagine that the party, having left their carriage at, at uh, Ard Kinnerochen Inn, a recently converted farmhouse serving refreshments to tourists from nearby Callander or Aberfoyle, have just ascended the steep path from the wicker hut, visible on the promontory above them, to the lockside quay where boats were kept in readiness to row visitors across to the little island made famous by Scott. You can see that wicker hut very clearly. Um, there's another couple of spectators standing outside it, uh, admiring the view. According to the Minister of Calendar, the Reverend James Robertson, writing in the Statistical Account of Scotland in 1794, there were two huts of wicker work for the accommodation of strangers wishing to admire and sketch this wild and picturesque landscape, as he put it. They'd been erected by the landowner, Lady Clementina Drummond, in the 1790s. And like the similar viewing pavilions erected on the Athol and Berdalban estates, we've already discussed in this lecture, they had framed visitors' perspectives on the Trossachs years before the publication of Scott's poem. In her recollections of a tour in Scotland in 1803, Dorothy Wordsworth described the poet Samuel Taylor Coleridge hailing her from one of the huts, quote, with a shout of triumph, exulting in the glory of Scotland. Ascending with her brother, uh, William, to join Coleridge on the high and per per perpendicular rock that rises from the bed of the lake, Dorothy had admired the view of Benvenu and Loch Catherine, concluding that the place was all eye and completely satisfied the sense and the heart. The popularity of the Trossachs as a tourist destination in 1803 is demonstrated by the fact that Dorothy obtained a slim guidebook based on Robertson's account, entitled Sketch of the Most Remarkable Scenery Near Calendar, from a waiter in the local inn. Contemporaries praised Scott for possessing a painter's eye that went beyond merely verbal description. And indeed, his account of Loch Catrin in Lady of the Lake seems to have influenced Knox's painting as much as his own field sketches made when visiting the Trossachs from his native Glasgow. Loch Catrin lay beneath him rolled, in all her length far winding lay, with promontory, creek, and bray, bay, and islands that in purple bright floated amid the livelier light. High on the south hung Benvenu, down to the lake and masses through, crags, knolls, and mounds confusedly hurled, the fragments of an earlier world. Scott has himself discovered the Trossachs, had himself discovered the Trossachs as a tourist holidaying from Edinburgh and he plundered all the available tourist guides in creating his own romantic vision of Loch and Mountain, as is evident from the copious notes of uh, The Lady of the Lake. How appropriate then that in 1820, the Inn at Calendar provided visitors with copies of all Scott's poems, maps of those districts which the Bard had rendered classic ground, and a little description of the scenery about Loch Catrin, prepared by the landlord of the Inn, and which consisted of quotations from The Lady of the Lake. Is according to a, a, a visitor from London with Meissner. In the wake of the poem's success, Lady Perth's huts indicated an onward journey through the literary landscape of Scott's medieval romance. Here in the Trossachs, events which had no reality, save in the imagination of the poet, were, quote, regarded as historical facts. Alighting on Ellen's Isle, Knox's, Knox's tourist Salamode would have identified with Fitzjames's vision of Ellen's Sylvan Hall, true to the poem, in the 1820s, 
A hut on the island, which is just visible in the painting, was hung with animal skins, furnished with rustic heather-covered chairs, as well as an old table with helmets, axes, etc., on it, according to the Yorkshire diarist um, Anne uh, Lister. Meanwhile, a tourist bagpiper, who would have been hired for the day, would send the bold pibroch from afar, prompting memories of the arrival of the war barges of Roderick Richalpen Gu in the poem's second canto, canto, and the singing of Hail to the Chief by his loyal clansmen. On taking leave of Ellen's Island, the party would return by a cove situated at the base of Benvenue, this location marked by a rising plume of smoke in Knox's picture, where they might experience the Gothic frisson of the den of the ghost, redesignated by Scott, the Goblin Cave. Here's a view of the uh, an engraving of um, the Trossachs after a painting by, by uh, Turner. In 1809, Walter Scott had published a disparaging review of the latest in the flood of romantic travel books about Scotland, Sir John Carr's Caledonian Sketches, complaining that it would perhaps be somewhat difficult to bring us news from Scotland, given the hundred volumes that had already appeared on the subject. Clearly, the Scottish tour account associated with Carr and his predecessors had become hackneyed. But just as Scott demolished the conventional travel book, he was busy inventing the literary conditions for the next wave of Scottish tourism. Building on the success of his narrative poem, The Lady of the Lake, sorry, The Lady of the, the, Lay of the Last Minstrel, 1805, set in his native borders, Scott now sought to st steal the laurels from Ossian Macpherson by romancing the Highlands in a series of best-selling poems and novels, notably The Lady of the Lake, Waverley, 1814, uh, the novel, Lord of the Isles, 1815, and Rob Roy, 1817. Largely inspired by um, the, these best-selling works, a new wave of tourism, powered by steamboat transport, and you can see here a uh, the Marion, um, one of the steam steamboats plying up and down Loch Lomond, taking tourists from um, Balach up to Inversnaid and Rob Roy's cave uh, and back. Um, this, this kind of um, steamboat transport created a new tourist infrastructure. This was further facilitated by Thomas Telford's Roads and Bridges. And in the years after Waterloo, tourists from the south poured into the highlands, just as uh, Hungry gales poured out, seeking for cheap passages across the Atlantic to escape from the clearances, driven out from their homes. Scott's romantic vision could be a screen hiding the harsh social realities of contemporary Scotland from tourists. But he was not entirely oblivious to the dangers of such aesthetic selectivity. Although his novel Waverley showed sympathy for the defeated Jacobite cause, the marriage of his wayward, wayward English hero, uh, Edward, Edward Waverley, to Rose Brabodine, symbolized a harmonious union between England and Scotland, ultimately celebrating the triumph of the new roads over the old ways. By way of closing, it's important to note that like Macpherson and Burns, Scott was not oblivious to the human cost of improvement as epitomized um, by the clearances, well underway by the time of the publication of Waverley. Although as a staunch Tory, he was careful uh, uh, to avoid offending his friends and patrons amongst the landed class. In an all too rare intervention, an anonymous essay published in the Quarterly Review for January 1816, Scott worried that the emptying of the Highland Glens, the consequence of what he called unrelenting avarice on the part of the landowners, was symptomatic of everything that was wrong with contemporary um, Scotland. The Highlands may become the fairy ground for romance and poetry, or subject to experiment for the professors of speculation, political and economical. But their traditional inhabitants, the Gales, once forced out of their crofts and townships would never return, even if Britain needed military recruits to stave off feared foreign invasion. But if the hour of need should come, and it may not perhaps be far distant, the Pibaroch may sound through the deserted regions but the summons will remain unanswered. The children who have left her will re-echo from a distant shore the sounds with which they took leave of their own. Hachil, hachil, hachil mitulig. We return, we return, we return no more. The Crimin's Lament. Here Scott seems to admit that his romancing of the Highlands as a fairy ground was as much to blame for emptying the region of its population as the writings of economists and modernizing theorists. 
In this lecture, we've seen how the unstable paradoxical relationship between romance and improvement was generated by Scotland's old ways and new roads, lying at the heart of Scottish Romanticism and shaping the poetry of Macpherson, Robert Burns and Walter Scott, as well as, as, well as the work of the artists with which I've illustrated this talk. Many thanks. <laughs>